Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to see you. It's good to be back together where we can worship together because I miss this. Take it for granted, then you don't have it for a little bit, then you realize how important it is. Let's, uh, let's join our voices together. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, singing Alleluia, Alleluia. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you singing allelu alleluia ask and it shall be given unto you seek and ye shall find Knock and the door shall be opened unto you, singing Allelu, Alleluia. Ask and it shall be given unto you, seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you, singing Hallelu, Alleluia. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, singing Allelu, Alleluia. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word proceeds from the mouth of God, singing Allelu, Alleluia. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the door and the vine. I'm the good shepherd, the bread of life, singing Allelu, Alleluia. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the door and the vine. I'm the good shepherd, the bread of life, singing Allelu, Alleluia. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, He leadeth me, by His own hand He leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by water still, or troubled sea, still tis God's hand. 
He leadeth me, leadeth me by his own hand. He leadeth me, his faithful follower I would be. For by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee. Since God through Jordan leadeth me, he leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me, his faithful follower I would by his hand he leadeth me. Let's stand for the next song. <coughs> this is holy ground. We're standing on holy ground. For the Lord is present and where he is, is holy. This is holy ground. We're standing on holy ground. For the Lord is present, and where he is, is holy. You are holy, God, a perfect and holy God. We will come before you with hearts made clean, by Jesus' blood, you are holy God, a perfect and holy God. We will come before you, hearts made clean, by Jesus' blood, we are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in his presence on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us pray. now we are standing in his presence we are standing in his presence we are standing in his presence on holy ground 
Please be seated. Good morning. morning. It is good to see everybody. I'm impressed that people remembered it was still January. Not everybody's sitting where they're supposed to. I like this. Uh, Just a few announcements. I do want to be sure everybody uh, looks to their bulletin for for updates to our our sick list. And remember to stay connected uh, on Facebook. Those updates go out pretty frequently there. Uh, just the, the few announcements I have this morning, uh, it is a fifth Sunday, however, we will not be having a, a fifth Sunday fellowship with Exchange Street this month um, in, in collaboration with our eldership and their eldership. We felt it was best to, to postpone that. However, tonight, uh, Sunday evening services are going to go uh, according to normal. We will still have our small groups this morning and our classes tonight. Uh, everything like that is still going to operate uh, as normal. Uh, stay uh, connected to the bulletin uh, for announcements regarding uh, events in the future. Uh, I think we have a fellowship meal planned toward the tail end of February and just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Uh, Is there anything I'm missing, Ron, this morning? Nope. Okay. Bow with me, please. Our Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, for the beautiful (coughs) sunshine, Father. We just thank you for all the good things that you have supplied us with. Father, we want to thank you for our visitors who have come our way this morning. We just pray that they'll return when they're back in the area, Father. Father, we have several on our sick list. We have a lot who are have the COVID, Charlie and Chris and Beth. And there's probably some that I don't know about, Father. And Father, we have a lot in this congregation who are recovering from the COVID. We're glad that they're able to be back with us this morning. Father, we ask a special blessing upon Steve Muse as he is to have upcoming surgery on his eye sometime in February, Father. We just pray that that'll be a success, be with him and and Beth in that. And for Denise Johnson, Father, we ask that you be with her as she is looking forward to some surgery and, and there's others listed in our bulletin, Father, just be with them. Father, this morning, as we have seen on the news, there is turmoil overseas, Father. We just pray that That'll be corrected, and uh, there won't be a war over there, Father. Father, we ask that you be with our military, especially those in that area. Just comfort them and protect them and let them know that, uh, that we're praying for them back here. And, Father, this morning as there's storms up in the northeast, some blizzards, we just ask that you be with those people also. Father, we ask that you be with Nathan as he brings us the lesson of the hour this morning. Let him have a recollection of the things that he has prepared. And as always, if there's been anyone here who has not named thy name, Father, and been baptized, let them do so before it is everlasting too late. And Father, we ask that you continue to be with us here at Troy in our unity, especially this year, Father. Father, just be with us and let each and every one of us strive for that. (coughs) Go with us now through the further exercise of this service. And, Father, if we have been faithful in the end, give us a home in heaven with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oh, the depths and the riches of God's saving grace flowing down for (coughs) me. There the debt for my sins by my Savior was paid in his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the riches of such wonderful love flowing boundless and full and free. And the debt my sins was all paid 
in his suffering on Calvary. How my heart humbly bows in his presence today when I think of his agony. By his stripes I am freed from the bondage of sin through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the riches of such wonderful love flowing boundless and full and free. And the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. Oh, what marvelous mercy, what infinite love, what immeasurable grace I see. By his blood I am cleansed, I am happy and free through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the riches of such wonderful love, listen full and free, and the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. If you were asked the uh, average churchgoer which book of the Bible is your favorite, John would probably pop up more than any other. Gospel of John is an interesting book, and one of the things that makes it so interesting is that John is the one who was such an intimate friend with Jesus. Matthew was one of the disciples, but not one of those close inner circle disciples. Mark was a young man when Jesus was alive. He didn't know him firsthand. Luke uh, traveled with Paul but didn't know Jesus up close and personal either. But it's John who gives us those little details about the life of Jesus, his ministry and teaching that uh, show so much interest in the intimacy of his relationship with Christ. In chapter 13 and verse 1 of John's Gospel, here are some very interesting words. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And what's fascinating to me about that text is that John says that Jesus didn't show them his love. He showed them the full extent of his love. And if you were to be asked, well, what, when did Jesus show the full extent of his love? No doubt you would say at the cross, the one we just sang about, Calvary. And you'd be right, of course. So what does John mean by this, that Jesus shows the full extent of his love? It's in this Passover feast. It's not the cross that John is referring to, or is it? It seems to me that when you put all this together from John's gospel, as well as the thinking and the other gospel writers, that John is really saying that the Last Supper, this Passover feast that Jesus changes into a new meaning for his disciples is part of the cross. It's part of that marching to the cross. It's all one large episode in the life of Jesus. He didn't show him his, their love. He didn't tell them about his love. He didn't give some grand new doctrine about his love. He showed them the full extent of his love. Well, what does that say to us? Well, it says to me that love is first and foremost a sacrifice in the Passover, the animal that was sacrificed to allow the 
Israelites to be saved from the death angels passing over Egypt that evening. And Jesus is that Passover animal, that lamb, so that his blood would cover us and the death angel of, in the spiritual sense would pass over us. Jesus is still showing the full extent of his love. It's through the cross, of course. But this Passover feast, this communion of which we are about to partake, is part of that march to the cross. Put that in context this morning as we partake of this bread and this juice that reminds us of that sacrifice of Jesus. Would you pray with me, please? Father, it's, it's beyond our ability to comprehend all that's involved in your plan to save us. But we know the simple fact is before the world began, you had this in mind. And that the Passover in Israel, of Israel in Egypt was just a forerunner of the Passover lamb that would be sacrificed for our benefit. And Father, as we take this bread today, I pray that our hearts and minds would reflect on that sacrifice that's so important that you planned it before you made this world. And for that, we are thankful. In the name of Jesus, amen. Pray with me again, please. Father, that blood that uh, was shed on the cross that flowed from really the heart of Jesus is still flowing today to cover us from all the sins that are prevalent in the lives of those who have given themselves to you. Father, as we have surrendered to you, we we pray that that mindset and that heart from us would continue today as we partake of this juice that represents the blood of Jesus that you have and will continue to cleanse us from all sin as we come with hearts that are penitent before you. Thank you for that blood, for this reminder of the sacrifice of Jesus. In his name, amen.
you probably heard it said quite often at times like this that you ought to give till it hurts. Well, someone, I think appropriately said, no, you ought to give till it feels good. And I think that would be a much better way to think about giving back to God what already is his that he's loaned to us to care for. And he expects us to use it wisely. Well, what wiser use could there be than to continue to support the work of his family in this area as we try to reach out to the lost? So as we pray today about this sacrifice of God, we also hope that you will think about your sacrifice to him. Let's pray. God, we, we're we grateful that we are among those who are fortunate enough to be able to give back to you and to the work here. And as we continue to move forward and, and try to do those things that would, would help others to see that Christ lives in us. Father, I pray that we be generous with our giving with our gifts to you as a display of our gratitude for the way you've provided through the years for each of us. Again, in the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. My heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I give to you, take control, I give my body a sacrifice Lord take control take control this time children are dismissed to children's worship and let's stand while they're dismissing you are beautiful beyond description too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, and in awe of you, you are worthy of all praise and honor, all glory is to you. Our words cannot express your greatness. There's nothing that compares to you. Who can understand your wisdom and power? Match the works of your hands. You were present long before creation. It was made at your command, 
And I stand, I stand in all of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God, to whom praise is due, I stand in all of you. Scripture in this morning is going to be from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts and through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend uh, with all the saints that what is the, the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Good morning. Y'all didn't think I was going to come from that side, did you? It is a great day to worship our God. Amen? Amen. I am so happy that you are here this morning. It has been a, a bit of a crazy, hectic last few weeks, but that is okay. It's gorgeous this morning. I'm happy to see all of you here. We are always mindful of those who can't make it with us. We hope that you're uh, joining us online, and we look forward to the time that you are able to come back and worship with us as well. Despite it being the last couple of uh, out-of-the-ordinary weeks, we are still going through a series that we have been calling Be the Church, right? We started the series back at the beginning of January. I know that feels like it's forever ago, and somebody even asked me this morning if I had like three weeks worth of lessons or talking all built in to one, if it was going to be like a long-winded sermon this morning. And that's not the plan, but you know, with the Holy Spirit takes over, who knows what will happen. Um, but we've been going through this series that we've called Be the Church. And over the last several weeks, we've talked about what that means, the importance of it. And last week, we started talking about these three little subcategories, if you will, of connect and grow and serve. And if you've noticed our banners on either side of the auditorium, you've probably guessed what the topic is going to be for this week. Last week, we talked about connect. This week, we're going to talk about grow. Lord willing, next week, we'll be together and we'll talk about serving. Uh, but I do want us to go ahead, and if you are already in the book of Ephesians, as you should be, thank you, Tyler, for reading that, uh, you should already be in the book of Ephesians. That's where we're going to kind of camp out this morning, because this morning we're going to talk about growing. Now, any organization that you're a part of, whether it's a church or whether it's a secular business, any organization you talk to, if you just start dis discussing things that they want to accomplish moving forward, growth is always nearly at the top of the list. Now, it may not always look the same, but growth is something that everybody wants. Nobody's going to invest in anything whatsoever if the possibility of growth is not something that is least potential. The only, the only business that you might possibly think of that doesn't want growing to be a part of their scheme is if you're going to invest in, in possibly weight loss supplements. But that's it. Right? Every, every business, every person wants to grow in some aspect, but we don't really ever talk about how that growth is going to accomplish or areas that we want to grow in. And so this morning, that's going to kind of be our focus. We've talked about connecting. Today, we're going to talk about growing. And the reason we've kind of done this is because a lot of times, as we'll kind of see this morning and last week, we have to be able to connect in order to grow. We have to be able to grow in order to serve. That's kind of the reason that we're going in, in this particular way of thinking about things. But this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about growing, and that being part of the focus that Troy has for 2022 and the vision and theme that we have for the year of being the church and how those things coincide. So first this morning, I want us to understand that we grow by reaching in. We grow by reaching in. One of my favorite movies of all time is Remember the Titans. Anybody else a fan of that particular movie? Is it just me? I love Remember the Titans. If you've never seen it, you should go watch it. Uh, but if you've never seen it, the movie is based on a true story where Denzel Washington plays the, the head coach of a high school football team of a newly integrated school. And one of the first uh, things that he does when he addresses his team is he gives this speech while they're at football camp, and he tells them, you know, there are going to be times that coaches think that a player is not good enough to be on the team, and they'll cut him. He said if a player is not up to snuff, he feels like he's hurting the team, he said he's going to cut him. 
Denzel says that that's not the case with me. This is a public school team, and I will never, ever, ever cut a player that comes out to play for me. And I have a little bit of respect for that, but he says this. He says, but when you put on that Titans uniform, you better come to work. And then he concludes this kind of introductory speech, so to say, by by saying perfection. That's what he's striving for. This team is striving to be perfect. Now, of course, he's not meaning that all of those individual players are going to be perfect as individuals, right? Humans can't in nature be perfect. But what he's saying is, is that as they begin to work, as they begin to practice, if they're going to be willing to put in the time and the effort to come together, as it were, and participate with each other as a team, they're going to become better to the point where the team as a collective is better than and is going to shine more than the individual parts. And the same can really be said for us as the church too, can it not? You see, this idea that none of us are perfect, but by working together, by growing together, by reaching into one another, we can become more productive than if everybody decides that they want to live on their own. But by that same token, that growth means that we have to reach in. If you look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, and let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Ephesians 4, 16 says, From him the whole body fitted and knit together by every supporting limit, promotes the growth of the body for the building itself up by the love and proper working of each individual part. You see, part of growing means that we have to be able to reach in. It means that we have to participate in each other's lives. It means that we have to participate in building each other up. It means that we have to participate in the work of the church. And some of you are going, can't somebody else do that for me? No, they can't. It's one of the things, next week it'll be fun. Next week, just for the record, I'm going to give teenagers a hard time because next week is serve, right? And everybody knows what happens to teenagers when you say serve or service project. Y'all tend to scatter. But we have to be able to reach in. We have to be able to participate with each other. We have to be able to encourage one another and be a part of each other's lives. We are all part of each other. The church was never designed to exist as individuals by themselves. That was a lot of the emphasis that we had last week when it came to connecting. And just like the first century, divisions were being made about Jews and Gentiles. Today, we make those same sort of divisions in and outside the body of Christ, whether it's by political party or race or income or something as simple as a college football team. Landon, uh, nobody, I like to give him a hard time. We create these divisions amongst us. And it's not supposed to be that way. We need to be able to grow in how we reach in. In reaching in to one another and how we encourage in one another and how we love and care for one another here and how we are involved in the work of the church here at Troy. That's really what uh, Ephesians chapter, I believe this is Ephesians chapter 2. Sorry, yeah, Ephesians chapter 2, you can see that growth is about being together. Ephesians chapter 2, you can look, I've kind of highlighted some of these things. Even when you were dead in your trespasses, Christ made us alive together. In verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one. In verse 16, it says he might reconcile us both to God in one body. In verse 19, they're fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. All of those things about being together with one another. And that doesn't accomplish, that unity is not accomplished, that togetherness is not accomplished if we're unwilling to reach in to ourselves. One of the things that we're going to do this year that I'm very excited about is we are making an effort throughout the course of the year to provide opportunities for reaching in and connecting. One of those is going to look like uh, so one of those opportunities, by the way, is our Sunday evening small groups, which we'll meet tonight, and I encourage you all to be a part of that. But one thing that we're going to do a little bit differently this year is that once a quarter, instead of meeting in those individual small groups, we're going to meet together as a congregation and have a fellowship meal on those Sunday evenings, the first one of which is coming up at the end of February. If you keep your eyes out for that, it'll be announced uh, really from now until then. 
And whether you're involved in one of our small groups or not, you are also invited and encouraged to come and be a part of those opportunities that we put together throughout the course of the year, whether it's going to be a Sunday night or a Saturday afternoon or a trip or whatever the case may be. We're looking for those opportunities to reach in. Why? Because the church cannot grow as a collective, as individuals, if we are not willing to participate with one another. I, I give COVID, uh, you know, the, the idea of having COVID, and, and again, I don't, I'm not trying to make light of anybody's situation. I'm not trying to demean anything that anything has done. But one of the things that I love that COVID did is we took an extra critical look at some of the ideas of where our worship had to be and could be and all that other stuff. However, one of the downsides to that is for a lot of Christians, COVID made living the Christian life a very individualistic thing. We talked about that a lot last week in the idea of connection. The church wasn't designed to operate by by ourselves. The church was designed to operate as a group of people reaching in, loving and encouraging one another. And I think it's important that we discuss the importances of reaching in. Secondly, though, we want to be able to reach out. Reaching out means exactly what you think it means. We live in a community. We are a part of a world that is divided, and people are looking for something to hold on to. I'm convinced that everybody has a God-shaped hole in their life that they have a desire to be filled, whether they realize that or not. I'm convinced of that. Not only does reaching out have the ability to help us grow numerically, but it has the ability to help us grow spiritually and in knowledge and in patience and in love and in kindness. Reaching out is, in essence, about evangelism. Making sure people understand what the church really is about. I know, I know, nobody in here has ever told somebody that they were a member of the Church of Christ and somebody went, oh, okay, right? That's never happened to anybody, right? And then you feel like you've got to explain to this person, no, 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 you've got the wrong idea. That's what reaching out really is all about. Growing in not just number, but growing in, which is always a thing with churches, right? And I'm not here to say that's a bad thing, right? We want to be able to reach the lost. That's kind of the Great Commission, right? Go and, and reach those and preach the word of, of truth and love. But we always talk about wanting to grow numerically, and that's good. There's a lot of good things in wanting more people to be a part of the body that we see so much value in. But reaching out also allows us to grow in knowledge and patience. We talked about this a little bit this morning. Anybody that's ever taught a Bible class understands that if I'm going to prepare myself to reach out and to teach somebody, I have studied more than that person. Or at least I should have studied more than that person. Let me put it that way, right? But reaching out is just about that. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 and 14 Verse 12 says, To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ. In verse 15, But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, which is Christ. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, we have the opportunity. Let us work for, let us work for the good of all, especially those who are in the household of faith. Now, you'll have to forgive me this morning. I listened to a seminar one time. Sam Whitworth, I believe is his name, uh, did a, a teaching rocket seminar. And he said that as a teacher, I am entitled to one soapbox per class. All right, so this is my one soapbox. You may get mad at me, but you'll have to forgive me. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, to 9 and 10 is one of the more encouraging verses in the entirety of the New Testament. This idea that says you will reap if you don't give up. Do not get tired in doing good works. But see, we have taken that and we have emphasized the household of faith and often ignore the part that says doing things for the good of all. And what we've done is we've begun to treat this verse as a justification for ignoring the needs of others because if we were to fulfill all the needs of others, then we might not have the ability to help somebody inside the church when they need help. And that's not what this verse is intended to do. The church and those outside are all considered in all, in doing good works for all. All right, I know I picked on Landon a lot this morning. I'm not going to pick on you specifically. I won't pick on Lowe's as, as a collective, right? Everybody's been to Lowe's, right? Nearly everybody's been to Lowe's. You ever noticed in Lowe's, not this one, I'm talking about other Lowe's, like the bad Lowe's. You ever noticed in Lowe's that all of the aisles are a little bit uh, shadier than like maybe your normal grocery store, right? You kind of have to squint a little bit to see what's going on and to read the labels and all that, except for one aisle. Which aisle? 
the lighting aisle, right? There's one aisle in every Lowe's that you feel like you got to put your sunglasses back on when you walk down it because of all the lights that are going on. And I think sometimes the church is a lot like the lighting aisle where we're all these lights and we're like all together and it's almost overbearing sometimes because we're all together and shining and it's great. But you see, the problem is Christians weren't called to be lights in the middle of a lighting aisle. Christians were called to be lights in darkness. And so if we start taking Scripture and we justify it as in we're not supposed to reach out, we've completely missed the point of what Ephesians chapter 3 is really all about. Ephesians chapter 3 is where Paul is talking about how the mystery of Christ was made known to him. And that that mystery was once imparted to Paul and he passed it along to the church at Ephesus and through his writing. And that's part of how we know God's will for his church. But this chapter talks about how Paul is saying to the church, now that you know, because I've been made known the mystery, and I've known, let you know. So now that you know the mystery of the gospel, which is that Christ came and died uh, for everybody, so that everybody has a chance to be a child of God, or has a chance to be a brother or sister in Christ, or has a chance to be a son of God, so that Jesus did that for everybody, not for a small collective. It is now your responsibility to spread that message with everyone. Everyone deserves to hear that message, and it's our responsibility to be sure that we share that message so that it comes across as the good news. All right, I said that this morning in Bible class, so for those of you that sat in my Bible class, I'm sorry, but we could preach the most truthful thing that exists if we do so with hate, we're not going to accomplish anything. Right? You have to be able to preach the truth in love, to teach the truth in love, to reach out to somebody with compassion. It is your access, uh, it's your uh, ability to do that. One of the things that I've seen scrolling through Facebook through the years, I saw this a while back, but it's something that has stuck with me for a long time. I saw a picture that said, you don't bring others to Christ by inviting them to church. You bring others to Christ by inviting them into your home. And the idea of that was, is it wasn't just trying to shove people in the door of a church building. The idea of it was, is that it was about relationships, to show the love and care that we genuinely have for other people by treating them as they are, which is a soul that God sees value in. So you don't convert people, you don't bring people to Christ by inviting them to church and just letting them sit by themselves in a pew in a really awkward worship setting. You convert others to Christ, you bring others to Christ by inviting them into your home, by inviting them into lunch, by showing people that you care about who they are. Those relationships is what opens up the opportunities that we have to serve and be involved in our community, which is what Paul is saying here. Now that I have made known the mystery of the gospel to you, you have the responsibility in love, with compassion, knowing that other people are valued by God, to share that with everybody else. And that is true to us today, but the only way that that happens is if we're willing to reach out. If we're willing to take off our blinders, so to speak. If we're willing to reach out to the person that we might not want to reach out to. James has a lot to say about that, about showing partiality when it comes to showing the gospel. We have to be able to reach out. Thirdly, we have to be able to reach up. We're going to grow, or we need to grow in our and by our reaching up. And reaching up is all about our relationship with Christ. We've talked about this in several lessons since I've been here, including last week. But this is about our relationship with God, that we need to be able to reach up and rely on Him, that we need to have all of our faith secured in Him, that we need to be grasped onto Him and His Word firmly with two hands instead of having one hand on Him and one hand on on the world. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 20 and 22 says, "Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone, in him the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, and in him you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit." Jeremiah 17 verses 5 through 9, "This is what the Lord says, cursed is the person who trusts in mankind." He makes human flesh his strength and his heart turns from the Lord. He will be like a juniper and the Arab. Uh, he cannot see the good when it comes, but dwells in the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land where no one lives. But the person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is in the Lord, is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by water. It sends roots out toward a stream, and it does not fear when the heat comes. Its foliage remains green. And it will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing 
fruit. That's some really incredible language there, a picture that Jeremiah paints. There is only one God. There is only one Savior. And if we are going to have any hope in growing, we have to have a relationship with Him, reaching up in how we praise Him, reaching up in how we worship Him. In Ephesians chapter 1, that's really what this is. It's, it's a chapter about praise. You see, verse 3, it says, Blessed be to God the Father. In verse 6, it says, To the praise of His glorious grace. Verse 12, it says, So Christ might be to the praise of His glory. Verse 14, it says, To the praise of His glory. And if you go back and you study that, all of these verses are actually breaking down God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that they're all in need of being praised. And as we go through and as we study and as we kind of grow in our relationship and we mature in our relationship with Christ, in essence, this is how we are being the church. That our relationship with Him is not tied to just the few hours a week that we're here, but in how we live our lives. And as we go and we study and mature, we understand that we don't praise God because He needs it. We don't praise God because He just wants it and tells us to. But if we take a look at what God has done for us in our lives, what He's actually blessed us with, the opportunities that God has given us, why would we not want to praise Him? It's all about being able to reach up and acknowledge that, look, I'm not perfect I'm striving to be more like Christ. And my relationship with God is what gives me the confidence in being able to do that. And so this year, we want to grow in our reaching in, in our reaching out, and our reaching up. But wait, there's one more. Y'all thought I was done. None of this matters unless we are willing to grow together. Growing together. Together. One of, if not the most important part about being the church is that we do so together. One of, if not the most important aspects about the growth, uh, about growth and, and what we do is that we do so together. I think I have Ephesians chapter 4, verses, yeah, 1 through 6 up here. Talks about how we are to paint, or paints this picture about the unity that we are to have and to strive for, that you have been called together with all the humility and gentleness and patience. You see in verse 3, it says unity. In verse 4, there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father that bring us together, that exemplify all of these aspects that we're supposed to show. And we're supposed to do that together. Interestingly enough, it's one of the more important parts about Remember the Titans as well. Well, I'm going to call it the second most iconic speech from that movie uh, is when the football team takes a run out to Gettysburg Cemetery where they fought the Battle of Gettysburg. And he stands there after they've run however many miles it is. I don't know exactly. But he stands in front of them and he gives them this speech. And in essence, that speech says that if they could not come together, there was never going to be any real success that the first battle that they had to overcome in that time, in that context, the first battle that we have to overcome if we want to grow as the church is we have to be able to come together. We have to come together in order to grow together. That's what he was telling them back then. That's what the first century church was being told by Paul. That's what preachers all across the country are preaching today is that if we don't come together, there's no way for us to grow together. In essence, Dr. Seuss put it like this. Unless somebody like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Lord willing, over the next several months, we're going to find and provide different opportunities of a different nature for us to grow, for us to reach in, for us to reach out, for us to reach up, for us to grow together. And I am very hopeful and want to personally encourage all of you to make the most of those opportunities. But there's one opportunity that is open 24-7. There's one opportunity that you can take advantage of any time you have a need, and that is the Lord's invitation. So if this morning you find yourself struggling in one or more of these areas, and you want us to pray and encourage and, and strengthen you and come together as a body of Christ, we can do that. If this morning you're willing and wanting to make the decision to dedicate your life to Him, to put Him on in baptism for the remission of your sins, we would love to help you with that as well. If there's any need, you can take advantage of this opportunity as we stand and as we sing.
take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Lord, I give my life to Thee, Thine forevermore to be. Lord, I give my life to Thee, Thine forevermore to be. Take my will and make it Thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Lord, I give my life to thee, thine forevermore to be. Lord, I give my life to Thee, Thine forever <clears throat> to be. Take my love, my Lord, I pour. At Thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee lord i give my life to thee thine forever more to be lord i give my life to thee thine forever more to be